that's number one. You kind of reset your painful tender to the touch. May right. also same shoulder length and the other. Hey everybody, welcome back. This is Real Health with Brandy and Amir. I am Dr. Amir Rashidian, a chiropractor. This is Brandy Rashidian, my other half. And uh, this is Real Health where we talk about how to feel better, get stronger, live longer and feel younger. And uh, we have, uh, we took a little break. So, so there was a little hiatus. So it's been a couple weeks since we uh, actually did one. I, I know the the, the podcast, the recordings are going live weekly, so there may not be a break there, but we actually did take a take a break, had a little we vacation did. in the middle and got some R&R. And, uh, it was really nice. It was nice. I and, got my uh, beach time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, I want to thank everybody for the comments and, and uh, questions you've been sending us. I, I certainly want to answer those. And there was one comment I specifically want to answer today, and uh, awesome. it was – it was about an error, and uh, we'll talk about that at the very, very end. But we have a lot of great news I want to get to, and I don't want to run out of time, so we'll start with those first. Perfect. And NBC News, uh, this is with Associated Press, reported on a kidney that was taken from a pig and put in a brain-dead man. Okay. So uh, the article title says, Pig Kidney Works in a Brain-Dead Man for Over a Month a step toward animal-human transplants. The experiment marks the longest a pig kidney has functioned in a human. Researchers plan to track the kidney's performance for an additional month. Wow. Well, that's not the first part of an animal that's been transplanted. Am I right that they use uh, uh, valves of... Heart valves. Heart valves, right? Of yeah. pigs in... Yeah. So yeah, they can use synthetic valves or uh, pig valves. And, and in, don't isn't there a better? Did, am I remembering right that there's a better response to to the pig valve? That's a good question. I'm not sure. I think uh, there was some pros to the pig valve versus the synthetic. I think if I remember right, we had a friend. Yeah. One of our best friends actually um, had to have uh, open heart surgery, right? Yeah. And he had to have. Um, yeah, they give you a choice. They say, do you want a pig or do you want something plastic? And I think the synthetic fail sooner. Typically, they have to be replaced. Yeah. But e I don't way, remember. I think either way, the valve needs to be replaced in okay. time. Maybe it's a, a timing thing. Maybe. But, yeah, so the good news is. It's not the first time an animal Correct. part has ever been used. Correct. Um, but this is, um, I mean, if you think about the implications of being able to utilize a pig organ as a transplant, right? You can grow pigs. Now, I am not advocating this because there are going to be people who love animals, as do we, who are going to say, you shouldn't do that to animals. And while that might be right, I'm not talking about the pros and cons of that. I'm just talking about the feasibility, right? And there is feasibility in being able to um, create these pigs for the purpose of, right? Yeah. I mean, we, we do it, it for fish. It's pretty impressive, yeah. To You know, we farm fish we sure. so that we have plenty. And and just, just to clarify, this, this pig was genetically modified well, so basically, it was it was raised to be an organ donor, yeah. which I'm a little bit put off by GMO food. So that concerns me. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it is interesting. I would like to know what was changed and why. It didn't say the article didn't say it. Says it, it looked better. It looks even better than a human kidney. Is this Dr. Montgomery said this on July 14th as he replaced a deceased man's own kidney with a single kidney from a genetically modified pig and watched it immediately start producing urine. Wow. It's pretty pretty cool. And now what they did was they took both kidneys out of the man. So this man has his brain doesn't function. Right. Apparently his sister donated the body to science. Okay. So they're keeping him alive that. on a ventilator mm -hmm. even though his brain has no function. But now if the brain has no function, there's no nervous system. We know there's a huge part of the immune system is right. connected to the nervous system. So we still don't know if his brain was functioning, if his immune system would Correct. attack this kidney or not. Correct. But so far, it's it's worked okay. And, and they modified the pig genetically to match this guy, it sounds like. 
because because you know like we have a patient who recently had a new kidney uh, his kidneys failed okay. his granddaughter said she wanted to donate a kidney wow i don't know if it, maybe it was his daughter i thought it was his granddaughter either way and he said no i can't do that i can't take your kidney she said fine i won't give it to you but i'm donating a kidney someone else is going to get it do you want it or not <laughs> wow <laughs> can i hire her i like people with gumption like it's that. it's it's neat That's yeah cool. it's really neat so she was determined to donate a kidney and and so he he's doing very well but you know one thing you have to understand is people get uh kidney transplants they need to be on immune suppressants right. for the rest of their life because at any moment if their immune system kicks in too high then they can reject the kidney or attack the right. kidney wow um just to read a little part of the article attempts at animal to human transplants have failed for decades as people's immune systems attacked the foreign tissue. Now researchers are using pigs genetically modified so their organs better match human bodies. Last year, with special permission from regulators, University of Maryland surgeons transplanted a gene-edited pig heart as a last-ditch attempt to save, save a dying man. He survived only two months before the organ failed for reasons that aren't fully understood. But that offer, but that offer lessons the, uh, for future attempts. So, so that offers lessons for future attempts. Now, uh, the Food and Drug Administration is considering whether to allow some small but rigorous studies of pig heart or kidney transplants mm -hmm. in volunteer patients. Interesting. I, I think I have a maybe a different version from another source of the same. This one uh, is the same article from New York Times. And it also says that, um, let's see, uh, where did it go? It was talking a little bit about um, what was genetically changed. So there were 10. Um, here it is. The kidneys uh, used at UAB came from pigs that under, had undergone 10 gene modifications. So 10 different genes mm -hmm. had to be modified. Uh, while uh, the kidney uh, at NYU, uh, Langon uh, Health, only had one genetic modification. So the latter procedure also calls for embedding the pig thymus gland, which is also responsible for educating the immune system. Wow. So they're hoping that underneath uh, that layering that will help to prevent the immune system attack. Right. So... But again, like you said, you know, having have uh, it's showing great results in a brain dead person, but there's so much of the body's natural processing that is now taken out that it is really hard to know how that would how that would really be how that would work down the road. So it's, that's very interesting. Well, I think we can move on from this one. I just wanted to say I had some numbers here. There's 100,000 people apparently. Uh, there's more than 100,000 pe uh, patients on the nation's transplant list. Whew. That's and a lot of people. Thousands die every year. Yeah. So, y y you know, I, I know there's ethical issues with using animals, um, uh, but there aren't enough organ donors for all the people who right. need those organs. I still go back to protect yourself so you don't end up in this situation. Right. I mean, w there could be a whole conversation about things that we could do, you know, to to make sure that our, our, our body is protected, that we're putting the right things in it, that we're coming in contact with the right things. We know there's, man, there's so many toxins, even that we've talked about on the show, um, that can affect our organs, affect our health. Um, so I agree. I think the other flip side is there's a lot of people in this country that um, maybe they haven't thought about um, donating organs. And so, you know, maybe that's a conversation that we need to be having again, you know, with with our spouses, with our kids, with, you know, adult kids, of course, and and saying, hey, what what do you think about this? And, um, you know, maybe if it's within, you know, the your ethical fabric of who you are ethically spiritually whatever the case may be maybe um you know being a, a donor is something you hadn't thought about and you'd be willing to right so i'm a i'm an organ donor me too 
Definitely. I don't think I'll need these organs when I die. So um, have at it. Everybody can have them. As many as you want. He takes lots of supplements, so I'm pretty sure he has got some pretty good organs. There. Yeah, and I exercise. <laughs> you know, it reminds me uh, of a real, real quick story. Um, Tony Dungy uh, was mm -hmm. the uh, Super Bowl winning coach of the um, Indianapolis Colts. Mm -hmm. He's, he, he, he coached another Super Bowl team, didn't win a Super Bowl, I think, uh, with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, I believe he coached. But anyways, he's great. He's an analyst now, and, and he's on TV regularly. Uh, but his uh, one of his sons committed suicide mm -hmm. and passed away, and uh, which, which is extremely sad. And he talks about this, and he said, um, he said, uh, if if God had told me that your son was going to give sight to a blind person mm. and save the lives of I don't know how many people his organs saved, um, saved the lives of uh, let's say three other people. Mm -hmm. Um, would you be excited? He said, I'd be very excited. He said, but if I have to take your son to do that, would you still let me do it? And uh, so anyways, that's, that's, uh, it, it's pretty tough. But to, to have the um, you know, courage and the emotional strength to talk about that, I, I, kudos to Tony Dungy and, and what he says and how he talks about this. But apparently his, his son's eyes were donated to someone who couldn't see. Ugh. Which is what a beautiful ending to such a sad, tragic story. Yeah, you know. So you mentioned the thymus gland. There was an article that came out on August second uh, that that said, um, "It turns out lowly thymus may be saving your life." Uh, and I, and I, th this is published in multiple other places. I just looked this one up. This is in the Harvard Gazette. Um, study suggests. Organ plays vital role in immune health, particularly cancer prevention. And so the thymus gland gets removed a lot mm -hmm. uh, when, when for other health reasons. And, and they used to say the thymus gland only acts in your immune system when you're a child. And after puberty, it withers down and shrivels down and it's useless. It's just something that sits there. But that's not true because the people who had their um, thymus gland removed had a higher risk of cancer than those who didn't. And we know cancer has an inflammatory and immune response to it and in fact now don't quote me on this but there's there are experts and research that says about five percent of the human body has cancer cells in it the healthiest mm -hmm. people they say have, they have cancer cells in their body or what because there's mutations and things that happen throughout the day we get exposed to radiation whatever mm -hmm. and uh your immune system actually searches out those cancer cells and destroys them and that's excretes cool. them. So that's why your immune system needs to be top notch. So the thymus gland, which sits right behind the sternum in the in the uh, breastplate, um, that organ apparently continues to help people in their immune system and does reduce the risk of cancer. So yeah. don't have it removed um, unnecessarily. Unnecessarily. Now I don't think any surgeon would remove an organ unnecessarily. So that goes without saying. I trust. Uh, I trust the surgeon. Um, the study comparing data from patients who had their thymus removed with those who had not found the th uh, that thymectomy patients had a nearly threefold higher risk of death from a variety of causes, including a twofold higher risk of cancer and a wow. more modest increase in autoimmune disease. Now, what's what's interesting is we there's a supplement that mm -hmm. we give our kids when they are under the weather when they have a cold we take it too we take it too. we just have a chewable one for kids yeah yeah we take it too and and this is um this is basically desiccated thymus gland and desiccated adrenal glands yeah it's very very cool now um adrenal glands release adrenaline which um pseudofed the drug uh kind of acts the same way it's a pseudofedrin it increases the adrenaline response which mm -hmm. dries up the mucus so actually reduces the symptoms so the adrenal part reduces the symptoms and strengthens the body because your adrenals have to work harder when you're sick and uh, the reason you got sick in the first place was probably because your adrenals were fatigued if you uh don't sleep well you know mm -hmm. like for example people who have a new baby oh yeah uh, they're not sleeping very well a lot of times they catch a cold easier or you catch a summer cold because you're stressed and you're not resting enough uh then then the other part of that supplement is the desiccated thymus gland from a cow which yeah. is very interesting and and literally we give these supplements to the kids and a cold that's supposed to last seven to ten days goes away in one two maybe three days yeah it's pretty amazing we've actually had people with 
uh, viral bronchitis with after like six, seven doses, they can sleep laying down. So it's, it's pretty impressive. It yeah. really, uh, it does help with symptoms, but what I love about it is that it actually really helps to support the body so that you can get over things quicker. Right. So it's not just about symptoms and that's part of the issue with some things we just take, you know, we, we walk into certain drug stores or, you know, grocery stores and, and we pick up stuff to help us with those symptoms. But sometimes those things yeah. also prolong the illness. It's true. So while you feel better a little bit, yeah. you're still not a hundred percent for much longer. Yeah. You know, and a neat example of that is vitamin C. A lot of people think vitamin C is beneficial to people who have a cold and, and I won't disagree with that. Vitamin C is beneficial. Uh, however, what we call vitamin C is not ascorbic acid. True right. vitamin C is a larger molecule. Uh, and ascorbic acid is kind of like the shell around that molecule. But most supplements, especially synthetic supplements, right. only take the ascorbic acid and say that's vitamin C. What ascorbic acid does is it slightly acidifies the body, which stops mucus production. So if you're sick, mm -hmm. you take a high dose of ascorbic acid, and all of a sudden you stop producing mucus, your nose doesn't run as much, you feel like you're better. You, it does help you feel better. Now, organic apple cider vinegar can do the same mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Um, so I think you have an article you wanted to share. Yeah, I have a couple. You know, you were you were talking a little bit about Tony Dungy and it was, it was so funny because um, uh, one article that popped up today was emergency room doctors beg for helping to help treating uh, children with mental health illness. So this one struck me uh, really hard and I was so sad to see. Um, they are saying from 2019 to 2020, there was a 24% increase, 24% in children ages five to 11 that are entering uh, an ER, not with a broken bone, um, an upset stomach, anything like that, but actually for issues of depression and anxiety and mm. um, uh, thoughts of suicide. And some of these kids are as young as five years old. That's crazy if we think about it. So two of our kids are in that age range. Yeah. I mean, um, they say uh, in this article from in, uh, NBC News, uh, the scope of this problem is really great, uh, says Dr. Uh, Mosen, um, a professor of emergency medicine and pediatrics um, at the David Geffen School of Medicine at the University of California. That's a mouthful, Los Angeles. But our ability to solve it is not there. So um, what they're saying is the emergency rooms and those physicians and staff are not equipped to be handling this influx of children who, and here's the numbers, they're actually staggering. A half a million kids each year across the country are entering into the ER for um, mental health issues. A half a million. Yeah. In San Diego, they said um, it, they used to have 30 kids a month. Now they're experiencing 30 a day. You know, earlier today, I, was, I did a little search. Uh, I just asked what, what are the most uh, common topics of healthcare that people are most concerned about. And number one was still COVID and uh, COVID vaccine, but number two was mental health. Yeah. Well, I mean, we need, to, we need to really ask ourselves, if we see that these numbers are staggering, let's go back to when they began to increase. And let's look at what we're doing as a society and what we're pushing and the things we're talking about and allowing our children to have access to. Let's start there, mm -hmm. um, because that that's uh, probably where majority of it is stemming well, no from. No one's going to forget what happened in 2020. Correct. Um, there's so much when you begin to pull children from, you know, communicating with people when they can't read facial expressions anymore when they don't have an understanding of why people act the way they act or yeah, why no, things have changed. Wrong. We're, we're, we're not going to take a stance today on whether masking was a mistake no, or not. Well, that's no. not what we're talking about. We're just talking about the outcomes of it. You know, it's the, the repercussions so, of whether everything Whether it was necessary or not, it was done. So I'm not going to criticize it and I'm Correct. not going to be upset about it. 
Uh, but I do want to make sure we undo the other damages, which is babies and children who don't know what a smile looks like because they couldn't see as many of them or can't can't have proper social interaction because they weren't around other kids for the first three years. Or of their how life. about their parents struggled with COVID mm -hmm. and didn't know how to function yeah. and therefore their anxieties and fear and all of that. We had friends who would come home and sleep in the garage and not see their kids and not hug their kids because they were first responders. For so sure. they, would, they, they literally put a bed in the garage and slept there and didn't interact with their family for right. a year. Right. So we, we can't have those things, whether right or wrong, whether necessary or not, that is, like you said, not the argument it's or the not. debate, especially at this point. It doesn't matter anymore. But what matters is there is very clearly massive challenges that our children are facing right now so let's try to fix that like in and i agree with them sending them into the er where they're not equipped to handle it is not right yeah. if you are seeing something with your children there are plenty of great professionals locally you know anywhere you go that will be able to you know help figure that out and and guide your kids because the last thing we want any of us as a parent is to see our kids hurting, suffering. So, so this happens even with us. So uh, you know, one of our kids will say something or behave a certain way. I go, he's just a kid. Let him go. Right. You can't ignore those things. Yeah. Not not when there's such a rise in mental illness and issues like this. That, that's 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 when parents get surprised, and that's that's me talking to us, going, yeah, 100%. you know, when when our kids make a comment or say something that um, seems wrong, or something that a child shouldn't be thinking or shouldn't be concerned with we should take that seriously just like with any illness uh we're wellness professionals we're not yeah. disease professionals right and wellness says you start taking care of your wellness you start early and you do it every day and you never stop and right. mental wellness is the same thing yeah and we need to there's always been a stigma attached to to mental health or mental wellness and oh, yeah. and that needs to be removed yeah because, let's get rid of that yeah um, there's not, there's, yeah people need help Absolutely. Just just like you, you, you can have an enlarged prostate, you can have an inflamed brain. Literally, 100%. there is there's types of fish oil. Um, you know, fish oil is divided into DHA and EPA. Yeah. Um, and actually, DHA in fish oil reduces brain inflammation, which That's is amazing. which has affected people who have PTSD, has helped people who have depression, anxiety, mood swings, um, and get nightmares as yeah. well. So. So um, there are certain fish oil brands and companies which separate the DHA and only give you the DHA. Right. Now, I don't think that's something that should be taken every day long term, but one to three months of right. high doses of DHA uh, and let your doctor decide what that high dose means. Uh, I'm not going to do that because it depends on your body size and mass and everything else right. and the level of problems you may be having. Uh, but at least we know it's one of those things that doesn't mask your symptoms like yeah. Sometimes maybe an antidepressant might do, uh, although, you know, uh, I most people who start on antidepressants stay on antidepressants, uh, and it's something that becomes a necessity for them. Again, I'm not criticizing it, but it'd be nice to not be dependent on yeah. things like that. Yeah, and I'm sure most people, if you if they think about that, no one should want to be dependent on something or someone to live um, in a vital way, right? Correct. Like nobody should want that. Now, I think sometimes we have a knee jerk response to somebody going, maybe you don't need that. And we go, wait a minute, that's mine. Like we, we have it like almost as an identity. And sometimes that's hard to get rid of, or we feel like somebody might be frowning on us, be, you know, because we're, you know, taking something that should never be the case. Um, just know for your own well being, less is always more. So if there's a pathway to ever not have a drug, that's always ideal, right? Yep. Um, because we let our, our, our body's natural um, abilities uh, shine through. Right. But if you need something, then you need something, right. right? But we always say, get to the bottom, get to the core of it. And if you're working to get to the core of it and you need something, then it, yeah. that's okay. E even if you're on a medication, uh, do some research, talk to some doctors, and see if there's a way you can reduce the need for that medication. Yep. I'm not saying stop taking it. Just see if there's a way to reduce the need for that. Everything yeah. has side effects. Uh, now, uh, one, let's, let's do one more. Uh, this one is, and we have a few minutes left. Yep. Um, this one was also NBC News. And um, 
The title is being in good physical shape could reduce the risk of nine types of cancer. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. Um, not that being in good physical shape doesn't have other benefits, you know? Correct. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> everybody wants, I, I don't know, hopefully you all agree, everybody wants to be in good physical shape. Uh, I mean, looking good. We all want to look good, look right? Good. Yeah, you look good. Feeling feel good. good. Yeah. I mean, I know right after a hard legs workout, I don't feel fantastic, but that's because I'm sore. But that's, that's not right. that my body doesn't feel good. It's yeah. just my muscles are screaming at me. But Absolutely. that's a good feeling. But you know, we, we go and play basketball with our boys. And it's just nice to have the ability to do that. Yeah. To, to be able to get out there and 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 play basketball at at a, at a decent level my our our 13 year old now is taller than me and um it's wild he's blocking all my shots so i'm i'm teaching him how to slouch so that <laughs> so that he'll look like he's shorter than me it's not working yet <laughs> but anyways so this this article um the study published Tuesday in the British Journal of Sports Medicine found that men with high levels of cardiorespiratory fitness in young adulthood had a lower risk of developing nine forms of cancer later, uh, uh, years later, including in the head and neck, the lungs, kidneys, and gastrointestinal system. The study followed more than one million young men in Sweden over an... Swedish people are in better shape, right? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, I haven't seen specific studies, but I would say it seems like they would be. Yeah. I mean, uh, over in Europe, the reality is that we, their food sources are better in many areas. That's a little controversial, yeah. Oh, okay. Like it. Yeah, it, it might be controversial. I know that when we have traveled to Iran, for instance, um, I can eat things there that I cannot eat here. Bread mainly. Bread, I can if I eat bread here, I pay the price. Like I, I mean, I love my bread, so because I do pay that price gluten because of the gluten sen sensitivity. But I do not experience that everywhere we travel. Well, we went to Greece and you had a lot of bread. Mm -hmm. We went to Rome, you had a lot of bread. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a lot of pizza in Rome. Yeah. And uh, don't judge me. Didn't I bother like you. <laughs> <laughs> so they're okay. allowed. They're allowed to judge you. We digress. Um, so uh, the study followed more than 1 million young men in Sweden over an average of 33 years, uh, starting when they took a military fitness test. Uh, that, until 2010, was legally required at around 18 years old. So every, every male at age 18 had to have this military test, fitness test done. Mm -hmm. I mean, just when you know you're going to be tested, I think you prepare a little bit. You if, think you know what I mean? Like if if they they told if they told our our kids, you know, they're they're seven, uh, ten, and thirteen years old. You told them, hey, at eighteen, you're gonna pass. You're gonna have, have a test by the military. They'd be like, okay, I'm gonna start doing some sit ups and push ups and maybe do some running. They would have because my our middle thinks that he might be able to play soccer when he gets into fifth grade, which is next year. So right before bed last night, he threw a fit because he couldn't go practice. Oh, and yeah. that's a year away. He was uh, he was angry. He had already showered. We didn't want him to get sweaty after he showered and he had to go to bed. Anyways, the researchers then analyzed the rates of cancer diagnoses among the men and compared them to the fitness levels registered on their military test. The authors of the new study uh, sorted participants into low, moderate, and high levels of cardiorespiratory fitness, a measure of how well one's cardiovascular, respiratory, vas cardiovascular and respiratory systems supply oxygen to the muscles based on their bike test results. They found that the people with high fitness levels had a 19% lower risk of head and neck cancer and a 20% lower risk of kidney cancer compared to the low fitness group. The risk of lung cancer, meanwhile, was 42% lower mm -hmm. for the fittest participant. It makes sense. Use your lungs when you're cardiovascular, well, yeah. uh, when you do cardiovascular activity. Though that was explained mainly by people's smoking habits, it Which says. Which I think is really funny that that's the only thing they did not point out that you have in increased. Yeah respiratory well it's, it says that the uh so as fitness level kept going up risk kept going down right. so it continues to do that so i guess you have to keep getting fitter and fitter 
um, the study showed that the risk for high fitness participants was nearly 40% lower uh, for cancer in the esophagus, the liver, the bile ducts, and the gallbladder, and about 20% lower in the stomach and colon. Yeah. A 2021 study estimated that within seven years, colorectal cancer could rank as the leading cause of cancer deaths in the U.S. among people aged 20 to 49. These are young people. Yeah, for sure. I'm almost out of that range. You're very close. Well, here's here's end. what question I would like to, without looking at this article in advance, that's you guys, how long of a workout do you think someone needed to do in order to achieve that reduction mm -hmm. because i think a lot of us go i don't have two hours i do this because your workouts are really long so um some of them are longer for me so sometimes yours are upwards of an hour and a half mm -hmm. to two hours eh, you're not really two hours right Today it was like hour and 40 minutes okay so some of us don't feel like we have that time right i i would probably be one of those and i may not have the desire to be in a gym for two hours it just i have other things that i need to do but it's not a two-hour workout that helped people achieve no. these results, which is really nice. It was, uh, it was actually, let's see, was it eleven? Yeah, it says eleven indeed, minutes? A March study involving more than thirty million participants found that just eleven minutes of daily physical activity was linked to lower risk of death from various cancers. I mean, that's that's pretty impressive. Now you have a couple of now they did not specify whether this was. Car just cardio or weightlifting or so I think there's some missing yeah. pieces of information, right? Because we know cardio alone, while it's great, um, there are so many benefits that people don't even realize when it comes to weightlifting. And when we say weightlifting, you don't, we're not talking bodybuilders, right? Yeah. You don't have to be a bodybuilder right. or a power lifter to be a weightlifter. So, so you so, just yeah, need to go in I mean, and lift if, weights. If, if you can sit down in a chair and get up out of that chair and just you lift your own body weight, well, then if you do the same activity holding an extra 10 pounds in well, your hands. Why don't we just start with two cans of peas? Yeah, then, then your own body weight will never be a problem. And you won't be one of those people who can't get out of a chair without right. help. Doesn't it also affect like our bone development? Yeah. Oh, it affects everything. I mean, so it, cool. it says it reduces risk of all these cancers. 13 out of 26 cancers studied, uh, yeah. the risk of those are reduced. Studies have shown that physical activity is linked to a 30% lower risk of death even after colorectal cancer diagnosis. Okay. So, so even when they have the cancer, there's 30% less chance they'll die if yes. they're, they're, they have and, good fitness. And let's also notate, they just said physical activity. Okay. Yeah. So if somebody goes, there's a bunch of you out there that are going, I hate the gym. Okay. It, it doesn't say go to the gym. Right. It just says physical activity. Right. Do you like dancing? Do you like walking? Do you like, you know, yeah. waving your hands around because you're, yeah. you talk with your hands. Well, just do that for 11 to 13 minutes every day. Yeah. Now this study didn't look at women. Uh, there was one that odd was thing about mistake. it. That's a big mistake. Always look at women. Contrary to the study's main findings, the data showed in this because women cause trouble. That's why. Wow. Uh, I was waiting for the. Contra <laughs> contrary to the study's main findings, the data showed an association between high fitness levels and an increased risk of two types of cancer, mm -hmm. melanoma and prostate. And they explained it by saying that uh, it's because these people probably are in the sun more, which I don't know because the sun hasn't been really linked to increasing melanoma uh when you look at the actual studies but i know uh, listen don't go out in the sun uh you know this is controversial but but there you are go out there, the there, there, there's higher instances of melanoma in countries that don't get much sunlight like the scandinavian countries that mm -hmm. have like four hours of sunlight right during the winter like it's, it's dark most yeah. of the time um uh, they, they have more melanoma right so so why is that and then people at the equator who are in the sun all day, who have the most sun, and the sun is the closest and it's the hottest. They have less. Very, very little. Now you go, okay, it could be genetics or whatever. You know, I understand. There's a lot of a lot of things that affect it. I personally believe, and it's personal belief, don't quote me on this. I think if you don't allow your skin to burn, you won't it there's less likely chance of 
getting right. cancer. We do know that your body produces the greatest amount of vitamin D, correct? Yeah. When you're out in the sun and you don't have sunglasses on. Yeah. Um, we know that there's a lot of controversy when it comes to sunblock. I will just say from personal studies and um, research, there are very few on the market that are not carcinogenic themselves. So do your research, yep. look at the chemicals that are in sunblock itself, especially some of the mainstream and yeah. see that some of those can be carcinogenic or they can also uh, disrupt the, um, you know, different parts of the immune system or it, it, just do your research. We, we've given you guys some sites in the past. Um, maybe we right. can put that on so people can, can well, do the research. How do you explain but... the increase in prostate cancer? People who are fit have Well, they can't explain cancer. it either. They think just more people got tested. They, that's what they said, yeah. That more people were screened because they're they're more into fitness, so they, yeah. they had their prostate checked. I don't know. Um, and, and prostate cancer is a whole issue. Um, it's a whole separate talk. Yeah, we could probably spend spend some time on that at some point um real quick I, I wanted to mention we had some comments um one one person on instagram said that um we we had earlier in one of the podcasts i mentioned that after having a baby uh new fathers get a surge in testosterone apparently that's wrong so let me tell you what my where i got that information was i did a year of post doctorate it was a one-year program postdoctorate pediatrics training and we studied you know um uh babies and development and mm -hmm. pregnancy and all that stuff and in one of my classes one of my professors had said uh, typically men and and now he, he even he said there's a lot of factors that affect testosterone correct if you're not sleeping enough testosterone plummets if you're eating wrong if you're not exercising there's so many different factors but he had said that there's a possibility of an increase in testosterone when you have a new baby because the male instinct is to protect the family and maybe that's in areas that are um dangerous maybe there's predators around or whatever right. now this was 2009 when i took this course in 2011 studies came out that said it's actually the opposite uh, new fathers have lower testosterone. So number one, I want to apologize for giving you false information. Number two, I want to thank the the person who commented and brought this to my attention. And uh, he's he's absolutely correct. He or she is absolutely correct. Um, and this was false information. So I will apologize. Everything else we talked about in that podcast, though, is true. So don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Um, we well, had a, a, don't do that ever. <laughs> Babies. We, we had another comment uh, about a gentleman who's, who said there seems to be a rise in, um, so this is, this is Ron, uh, a close friend of ours, actually. Um, he said he loves the podcast. It's interesting, informative. He said he's a fan. Um, he talked about Parkinson's, and he, and he said uh, it seems like there's, there's an uptick in, in the case of Parkinson's. And, and, you know, I feel like I see that too. More people right. seem to have Parkinson's. But I did a little bit of research, Ron, and that doesn't seem to be the case. The data doesn't show that there's a higher prevalence of Parkinson's now than there was before. And also the cause of it is still very much unknown and how it affects the body is unknown. Uh, but the medication seems to have improved and, and a lot of people are living longer and easier and better lives um, with Parkinson's. So, um, and I think we're in a, we're in a um, time where information is just passed more readily. Um, it's easier to come by. So it might be that we hear about it more um not that it's more prevalent do you know what i mean correct so correct it could also be the age group that we're in now yeah oh, you yeah. know when we were younger we hung around younger people who didn't have parkinson's now we're getting older we're hanging around people who, you know have other issues yeah and uh and that changes it's like do you, you remember a time where all your friends were getting married and every weekend you're invited to a different wedding yes and then you got all these baby showers and then and, then it, and it, now you have a bunch of formal dresses that you can't wear anymore you can't wear anymore and, and then th there's going to come a time where we're like invited to graduation parties because yeah. everybody's all of our friends kids are graduating of course we had kids a lot and later getting married huh. okay. oh my gosh more weddings come on so anyways i hope this was all useful um i wanted to talk about other stuff but we are out of time but we we did a longer one today because we hadn't done one in a little while and things had kind of piled up but we're back on track and yes, rolling along i hope listen uh i'm gonna ask as a favor please like subscribe comment and all of that stuff and share and share these videos i also want to tell you 
you don't have to do any of those things for us to appreciate you. Just the fact that you showed up and you watched and you listened, we love and appreciate you. So if you just do that, we're grateful. But if you want to help us get the word out and help more people, share more information with more people, certainly we would love it if you would share and subscribe. And uh, and if you ever come across an article you'd like us to process and and talk about, um, you know, we're we're just a few people, yeah. and and we there may be one that you find interesting and right. that we've missed. Um, so please feel free yeah, and bring it up, even absolutely. if it's a week or two. And old. those of you who are fact checkers, yeah. fact check us and tell us. Yeah. We'll learn too. We listen. We're not perfect. And remember, there's tons of studies out there, and there are a lot of studies that contradict, contradict each other. Yep. Um, because people have a different focus and a different when they're doing these studies. And so, you know, data gets interpreted differently. And it's always good for us to look at every single side of a coin, because that's how we can, as individuals, process through and find the best, most accurate information. Right on. Love it. Thank you, guys. We'll see, see you, you next, next time. time.